Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video we will cover when to use metabolite techniques for hypertrophy training. First and foremost, we need to understand what exactly metabolite techniques are. To understand this, we first need to look at the mechanisms of muscle hypertrophy. This research review aimed to identify what the driving factors of muscle hypertrophy are. It was concluded that there were three potential mechanisms responsible for promoting muscle hypertrophy. These are mechanical tension, metabolic stress, and muscle damage. Mechanical tension refers to tension experienced by the muscle through dynamic stretch and contraction against resistance. It seems that mechanical tension is the primary driving factor of muscle hypertrophy. Muscle damage refers to microtrauma induced through overloading resistance training. The inflammation and repair process has thought to be somewhat hypertrophic, although it is difficult to assess whether this is just an association with hypertrophy or an independent mechanism itself. And lastly, metabolic stress refers to the accumulation of metabolic byproducts in the muscle cells during resistance training. This occurs as a result of anaerobic metabolism and causes fatigue of the active muscle fibers. As the muscle fibers fatigue, high threshold motor units are recruited, which exposes them to mechanical tension during resistance training. It is still unclear if metabolic stress has an independent influence on muscle hypertrophy, or if it indirectly promotes hypertrophy via its fatigue effects leading to greater mechanical tension. So basically, metabolite techniques are forms of resistance training which promote greater metabolic stress to the target muscle. This is usually conducted by shortening rest periods or performing higher rep ranges. Some examples of metabolite techniques include drop sets, myo reps, rest pause, supersets, blood flow restriction, and more. The exact form of metabolite technique that is used doesn't really matter to any significant extent. The point is that all of these techniques promote significant metabolic stress by limiting rest or using higher rep ranges. So how do metabolite techniques influence hypertrophy compared with traditional resistance training? Before we explore this, we first need to understand that there is no specific definition of metabolite training. Rather, some training methods promote more metabolic stress and some training methods promote less. Metabolic stress is experienced during all rep ranges and rest period lengths, although the magnitude of metabolic stress changes. This systematic review proposed this hypothetical graph of what mechanisms contribute to muscle growth at different rest intervals. As we can see, mechanical tension and muscle damage are greater when training with longer rest periods, while metabolic stress is lower, but still present. As rest intervals shorten, there is a greater proportion of metabolic stress, while mechanical tension and muscle damage are reduced. So rather than thinking about metabolite techniques as a standalone training method, it is more accurate to think of this on a spectrum. So now let's cover what benefits and negatives metabolite style training can have on hypertrophy. First, let's start with the negatives. There is only really one negative of metabolite style training. However, it is a major negative, and that is that metabolite style training probably doesn't induce as much muscle growth on a per set basis compared with traditional training. This meta-analysis analyzed the research on training with different rep ranges and loads. It was found that hypertrophy can be equally achieved across a spectrum of different rep ranges and loads, provided that sets are taken close to failure. So it is probably not the use of higher rep ranges or lighter loads that results in inferior hypertrophy. However, this systematic review assessed the research on how different rest periods influence hypertrophy. It was found that there was no significant difference when training with different rest periods, although there was a slight trend in favor of longer rest periods. So because metabolite training limits rest periods between sets, this may limit hypertrophy outcomes slightly. However, longer rest periods are only likely to be very slightly advantageous compared with the shorter rest periods. The reason for this advantage is probably due to shorter rest periods limiting performance. This study found that 3 minute rest periods between sets were superior for muscle growth compared with 1 minute rest. As we can see, volume load was greater in the longer rest period group compared with the shorter rest. In other words, longer rest periods allowed trainees to perform more reps and or lift more weight each set. This may be a potential reason why longer rest periods are slightly superior. So it seems that metabolite techniques are probably slightly less hypertrophic per set compared with traditional resistance training with longer rest periods. However, does this style of training have any unique benefits? There are two potential benefits that we will now cover. 
The first is time efficiency. Metabolite style training methods are much more time efficient than traditional sets. This means trainees can get more volume done in a shorter period of time. Even though each set may be slightly less hypertrophic, trainees are finishing their workouts in a shorter time frame. This means that trainees could even add more sets to their workout to accumulate more volume, which may actually provide a more hypertrophic stimulus. For example, let's say a trainee was to perform three sets of bicep curls with two minutes rest between sets. To make things simple, let's assume each set will take one minute to complete. So the three sets would take a total of seven minutes to complete. If trainees were to shorten rest periods to 45 seconds as a more metabolite style technique, the three sets would take four and a half minutes to complete. Then if trainees wanted to, they could even add a fourth set, taking the total time up to six minutes and 15 seconds. In this scenario, the trainee is performing more volume and still getting their training completed in a faster time. And the second primary benefit of metabolite style training is less joint stress. Because rest periods are shorter, lighter loads are used with metabolite style training. This involves lower forces on the joints and connective tissue, which is overall less stressful compared with heavier loads. This means that trainees may be able to handle more weekly volume before the joints become irritated and experience a pain response. For example, a trainee may notice that they can't perform more than 10 weekly sets of direct bicep training, otherwise they tend to develop joint pain. However, if some or all of this volume is replaced with metabolite style training, the overall joint stress will likely be lower. This may allow trainees to push their weekly volume up to 12 or 14 sets for biceps without developing joint pain. So now that we've compared the benefits and negatives of metabolite style training, let's now cover when it is appropriate to implement. In short, metabolite training doesn't have to be used at all if the trainee doesn't want to use it. However, there are certain contexts in which metabolite training is more and less suitable. Let's now cover what factors will influence when this training style will be most appropriate to implement. The first factor is what exercise metabolite techniques will be used for. This style of training is more suitable for some exercises and probably not the most suitable for others. During hypertrophy training, we want the target muscle to be the limiting factor for each set. We don't want fatigue of any other systems to limit performance before the target muscle, as we want the adaptations to take place in the muscle we are trying to train. For this reason, metabolite style training is probably least suitable for exercises which involve many muscles and joints and those with high stability demands. This is because these exercises are more likely to result in fatigue of other accessory or stabilizer muscles, which may limit the stimulus on the target muscle. Furthermore, compound lifts will have higher cardiovascular demands because more muscles are working simultaneously and heavier loads will be lifted. On the other side of the spectrum, isolation lifts with low stability demands are more suitable for metabolite style training. This is because the target muscle will pretty much always be the limiting factor if technique is strict and effective. So regardless of how short rest periods are, the stress will always be concentrated on that specific muscle group and adaptations will take place where we want them to. Like we mentioned previously, metabolite techniques are not a black and white training method. Therefore, we also have exercises between these two extremes. Something like a seated cable row is technically a compound lift but it is not as globally fatiguing as something like a back squat. Therefore, an exercise like this may sit somewhere in the middle of this spectrum. This means trainees could use moderately short rest periods to capitalize on some of the benefits of metabolite style training, but not excessively short rest periods as would be used with conventional metabolite techniques. The next factor to consider is exercise order. Metabolite style training is generally more fatiguing on the target muscles and cardiovascular system compared with traditional sets. This is because there will be a large accumulation of metabolic byproducts in the trained muscle, which will temporarily result in high fatigue levels. This means subsequent exercises involving that muscle group will probably be inhibited quite severely. Therefore, it is probably most appropriate to use metabolite style training for exercises at the latter end of a workout, almost as a finisher type technique. This is because there will be no other exercises performed after this, so the acute fatigue won't inhibit performance of subsequent exercises. The next factor to consider is total weekly volume for a particular muscle group. If volume is fairly low for a muscle group and the trainee doesn't have any strict time constraints, then it is probably not necessary to use metabolite techniques. 
This is because traditional straight sets are probably more effective per set compared with metabolite training. So if volume is not excessively high, it may be more effective to allow longer rest periods to maximize muscle growth with each set. However, if a trainee is performing high volumes for a specific muscle group, or just high training volumes in general, it may be useful to include some metabolite training. This can condense more volume in a shorter time frame, allowing trainees to finish their workout sooner. Furthermore, it is much more time efficient to add additional volume using metabolite techniques compared with straight sets. And the last consideration is injuries. If a trainee tends to develop joint pain with certain volume thresholds or with specific exercises, metabolite style training can be a strategy to alleviate pain while training. This is because it can provide a hypertrophy response using lighter loads compared with traditional training. This causes less joint and connective tissue stress, providing a hypertrophy response while minimizing the risk of joint irritation. So to summarize, let's establish some practical recommendations from this information. Metabolite style training is that which involves short rest periods and light loads. This is probably slightly inferior to traditional hypertrophy training on a per set basis although probably not by much. Metabolite style training is much more time efficient and less stressful on the joints and connective tissue due to the lighter loads used. Metabolite training is not a mandatory strategy to implement into a hypertrophy training routine, although it certainly can be useful in some cases. It can be useful for trainees to accumulate more volume for a specific muscle group to make training more time efficient or to alleviate joint and connective tissue pain. If implemented, it is best to use on isolation lifts towards the end of a training session. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.